So a couple of people that didn't get thanked. Uh, tech team, I know no one can see you and you hate the attention, but if you could see all the things that they were able to do this week, especially because the staff, when they were, yeah, give them a hand. The staff have characters to play in the skits, and I don't know if you know your staff very well, but they're very creative, and so um, on the day, there's always this plan, and then the day of, lots of things get changed, and the tech people have to adjust, and they just did a great job. And then the band, you know, I, five, four nights, and then back here this morning, and they still have voices. That's pretty impressive. Speaking of the band, I want to mention one thing. Um, there's a program that most churches use for their audio that it's, it, it, basically what it does is it, it corrects your pitch if you're singing, um, and it just takes it to the closest note. I don't know if those of you who were here last week, someone thought that Kurt Dykema was having a stroke because he was so off. Kurt does not off. Well, the thing is they changed the key of a song, um, in the before the services and the pitch correction was still trying to correct to the other key So I got a text. I was in mosaic. I got a, or Someone got a text in mosaic like someone needs to check on Kurt Because he might be having a stroke and so they brought the first responders down to check on Kurt So it wasn't Kurt. He's not losing his voice. It was a correction and we're not going to correct via key anymore um, Because we, it goes out online. It goes out uh, into the booth over there. It goes out there and it comes in here. You're mixing for three different places. You just want to make sure that every experience is just right. And that way, if someone's straining, they, they get the note. We're not fixing it the way we used to fix it. We're going to fix it in a different way. I didn't even know we were doing that. If I would have known, I would have volunteered to sing because they might make me sound okay. Um, <laughs> So I want to tell you what we did this week, and then I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to continue in our series, although we have a shortened version uh, of the sermon in here. Um, so this week, you've heard survive and thrive in God's kingdom. Uh, there's a difference between survival. Lynn uh, and Jen brought in two plants, one that was almost dead and one that was blossoming and blooming. And one is surviving, the other is thriving. And so a lot of times when we think about Jesus and what he did, you know, almost everyone can say he came, he died on the cross to save us from our sins. And that's kind of that survival mentality. Like when we die, we get to go to heaven so we don't get... It's fire insurance, right? We're not going to go to the hot place. We're going to go to the good place. Um, that's just surviving. But thriving is that the whole idea of, of, of the gospel, the whole idea of Jesus coming here was so that we don't, we don't just survive. We have an opportunity for abundant and everlasting life that starts right now. So day one, we started this year on the resurrection story. We talked about when Jesus and John, um, late in, the, in, in John's gospel, then he showed up to his disciples. Uh, we got to tell the story of the crucifixion and the resurrection, but then what, what, did, what did God ask? What did Jesus ask of his, of his disciples once he had resurrected? And then the next day, uh, Mary Magdalene, that, that, that God uses unexpected people. In fact, if you look throughout Scripture, if you think of um, uh, the walls of Jericho, a non-warring people, which are the, the Jewish people, they were a ragamuffin group, um, God did use unexpected people to do an impossible thing in a ridiculous way. So walk around the, walk around the city for uh, every day for seven days. So let them know how many people you are, make it predictable, and show them what your weapons are. And the seventh day, do it seven times, and then scream. He used unexpected people to do impossible thing in a ridiculous way. Same thing with Mary Magdalene. She was a demoniac, and God, Jesus, delivered her. God, God in the form of a person, Jesus, delivered her, and then gave her the great honor. She followed the disciples around uh, for all of Jesus' ministry, and she had, she was one of the very few people that had the great honor of having a resurrection experience with Jesus. And then the next day was the conversion of Saul to Paul. And we were talking to the kids about um, the fact that, that even if you've messed up, God's not done with you. He wants to keep moving you to become the person he wants you to be, not the person that you once were. And Saul was a great persecutor of Christians. He was a Jewish person thinking he was doing the right thing, but he was actually doing the wrong thing. Jesus met him, confronted him on that, changed his life, made him blind for a while, and then he sent a guy named Ananias to go give him back his sight. And Ananias is like, I'm not going to him. He, he's a bad dude. And, but God said, go and give him back a sight and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Now, we don't love that part of the calling, but, but Saul became Paul and then the Christians didn't trust him at first. 
And then once, once through Barnabas, once they, they figured out that he's actually a changed person, then the people he used to work for, the Jewish people, wanted to get rid of him. So we were just trying to explain to the kids that, yeah, you, even though you might do something bad, even though you might mess up, God still can redeem that. But it's also, if you're living for Jesus, sometimes people don't want to hear what you have to say or don't want to see what you have to show them. And then the final day uh, was Peter escaping from prison. And the, the, the overview I'll give you on that one is simply, if God has something he wants done, he will not just work within the system, he will break the system in order to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. And he uses us to be a part of God-sized work. And so every one of you, every one of these children, every, everybody is capable of being used by God to do miraculous and powerful things. And then one other comment about VBS, and then I'm going to read from, uh, from Hebrews just for a moment. And that is that our student, well, I don't want to just give all the credit to, to our children's ministry staff, but uh, every year I get to teach to the, to the oldest group. And I am blown away year after year how much they know, how wise their questions are, how, how insightful their questions are. And, and when you say, hey, does anyone know the story of? They do. And I, it, it's, it's the parents it's the student or the children's ministry staff. It's the, all the volunteers from VVS, but it's also the Holy Spirit of God working in the hearts and the minds of children. And if you, this is not, I'm not doing a plug, but if you want to know of a church that's doing children's ministry real, really, really well, I have nothing to do with that, but they are, the, the staff and these volunteers are amazing people. If you want your children to know Jesus and to understand the story of God's people, this might be a place you want to check out. Now, we're in a, we're in a, um, a series on Hebrews, and we're not going to give you the, the whole thing. It's about a 25-minute message. I'm going I'm to focus on one part, but I want to give you a little bit of, just a little bit of background so you can understand what the author of Hebrews is saying. First of all, Hebrews is a book of better things, okay? It starts off with Jesus is better and bigger than the angels, and then uh, he's better and bigger than Moses, and then it moves into he's better and bigger than the law, and he's better and bigger than the priesthood. We don't understand the priesthood, because we don't have, I mean, you think Catholic priests, you think uh, Eastern Orthodox priests, uh, but, but the kind of priesthood that they had back in, the, back in Jesus' day, we don't really have much of a concept about it. So just let me tell you a little bit about what the priesthood did. The priests, their job was to know God. They were to be picked by God and then to know God and then to stand before God and plead on behalf of the people and to stand in front of the people and to plead on behalf of God, calling the people to faithfulness and when they weren't faithful to call on God and ask for forgiveness. And the way they did that was they offered up sacrifices. That, so if it, let's say that I did something really wrong and I came to Passover and um, I'm supposed to bring a lamb to sacrifice to have the priest kill it. They don't do that anymore, but to have the priest kill it. And then the blood being spilled was to make me right with God again, okay? But you couldn't bring the lamb and put it in front of the priest and he goes, you're good because suffering and blood needed to be spilled. I know that's kind of gross, but that's what it was. We're told in Hebrews chapter 4, 5, 6, and 7 that Jesus is the new great high priest. He's greater than the priesthood. And, and we find out in there that that sacrificial system, the, the offering up of animal sacrifices, that was, from the beginning, was incomplete. And God made it, God made it so it was incomplete and had to become corrupt. But in these chapters, God tells us about another type of priesthood. And he talks about a guy from way back in, in the days of Abraham, Melchizedek. And that he was both a priest and a king. And the scripture tells us that he is going to be a priest forever. Even though he was a man, he died. Um, and then he compares Jesus to him. And so we're only going to read a piece of it. But I want you to know, you got to understand a little bit about, uh, about the priesthood in order to understand the significance of what this author's saying. So let me pray, then we'll read. We'll talk for a moment, and then we'll close. Lord, we only want to hear what you have to say. We only want to see what you have to show. And we only want to receive what you have to give. So let these words, Lord, go out and not return void, but accomplish what you want them to accomplish in each person here. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So it says here, therefore, since we have a great high priest who came, uh, who has gone through heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And then he goes on to describe um, that God is the one who calls priests and that God himself, as Jesus as God, but as a man, called him to be the last high priest. Because all these other high priests, they, 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 they were called, they, were, they served for a while, and then they died and went to heaven. Jesus was appointed high priest. He became the high priest, and he didn't sacrifice an animal. He sacrificed himself. And when he rose again from the dead, he became the high priest that will always be the high priest. Why is that significant? Well, because it used to be that each time you messed up, you had to go and offer a sacrifice. We're told in this chapter, in the chapter 5, that Jesus was the sacrifice forever. Now, I don't know if you're always thinking about that, um, but it, it has occurred to me these last couple of weeks as studying this that, that it, 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 it's a strange concept because I don't usually think about it like this. I'm not thinking about the fact that Jesus is always, the big word is interceding. He's always standing before the Father pleading your case. And he's always, through the Holy Spirit, standing in front of us, pleading God's case, letting us know who God is, letting us know what God wants, letting us know who God wants us to be. He's always doing that. He's always doing it. But sometimes we get this idea that, that I'm, I'm, when I mess up, it's just, yeah. and, and I don't know if you do this or not, but some of us, no, no almost nobody does this. You ever, take a, you ever clean up before you take a bath? Only time I remember ever doing that is if you come home from hunting, you've been camping, you got smoke all over, you got deer scent, and, and your wife might say, all that comes off before you come in the house. But most of the time, the reason you take a bath, the reason you take a shower is to get clean. But sometimes, even those of us who are trying to be faithful to Jesus, when we mess up, we feel like we have to clean ourselves up before God can accept us. I just want to tell you, that is a lie. This passage tells us two things really clearly. One, that, that we can confidently approach the throne of grace, okay? What does it mean to confidently? Is that like a, uh, uh, like a spoiled kid that realizes that if they throw a tantrum in the checkout line at the grocery store because they got a candy bar last time when they did it, they're going to get a candy bar this time that they can manipulate and get? No, that's not what it's saying. But you don't have to come to God like a dog. Have you seen those videos, kids? You, 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 if you ever watch YouTube or watch videos, you ever see those when someone comes home? Uh, they, it's on America's Funniest Videos a lot. Someone comes home and they see, they just have a camera and every cushion on their couch has been torn apart and there's the stuffing everywhere. And they go, who did this? And the dog's like, you know, we don't have to come to God that way. We don't have to come to him ashamed because we're supposed to come confidently. Why? Because there is always mercy and grace for us in our time of need. And here's what I mean by that. I'm going to quote the great theologian Sparky Anderson. I've quoted him before. I don't know the context that he said this, but I've never heard anyone describe mercy and grace better than Sparky Anderson. I think it was in a fellowship of Christian athletes or something, but you know, the way he described it is grace is getting what you do not deserve and mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Now, the beauty of that is that Jesus is always offering mercy and grace, not just when you're awake, not just when you've messed up. He's always doing it. He is perpetually, it is always, let me put it this way. He is always thinking of you and he is always wanting the best from you and he's always providing the best for you. He is never giving you what you truly deserve and he's giving what you can never earn, grace and mercy. He, he became the lamb that gets sacrificed. He became the priest who offers the sacrifice. He became the living sacrifice forever, all the way back in the beginning of time, all the way to the, to the, to the end of time, and right now. So students and adults, please, one thing I ask you to consider is that God is always considering you. There's never a moment where he is not thinking of you 
and providing for your well-being, providing for your salvation. Never. But sometimes we think that we've messed up enough that we can go, I probably, I probably messed up too bad. Well, that John Calvin, a, a great theologian way back in the day, he had this theology called the perseverance of the saints. And because his people were so afraid of losing their salvation, so afraid of messing up so bad that they lose it, that they got paralyzed and they wouldn't, they wouldn't speak about it. They wouldn't act on it. They wouldn't do anything. And he's like, folks, once God's picked you, you can't lose it. You're always going to be part of his covenant people. So you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to, to wonder. You can be assured that you have a great high priest who understands he suffered, he's been tempted, he's done it all, and it was real temptation, it was real cries of pain, it was real, all of that stuff, just the way you felt it, the way you've experienced, he's done it. So we don't have to wonder if he gets it. He gets it. You know, sometimes when you're, when you're in sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, even up to twelfth grade, you might go to your parents, you don't get it. Yeah, they actually do. They lived it too. We have a God that gets it. And we have a God that forever, today and every day for the rest of your life, every moment of every day is thinking about you, considering you, and offering you everything you need to be the person he created you to be. Let's pray. Almighty God, we bless you. We praise you. We thank you for who you are, for what you've done for us, for what you do in us, and for what you're going to do through us. We pray that you give us the confidence to approach you so that we can receive mercy and grace anytime we need it, because you are always giving it to us freely. Join us as we sing, as the kids come down one more time, as we sing Survivor, and as these children pronounce your blessing on the rest of us. Amen.